Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Dave's Math Channel. I'm David Tear. Today I'm going to talk about um, one of the most important numbers in math, probably the most important irrational number called pi. I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, anyway, um, here's uh, fifth, the first 50 digits of pi. I actually have memorized 100 digits. I'm not going to um, tell you all of them. That's in another video. But uh, you don't really need to know this many. Most people only know the first two, 3.14. And that's pretty good enough for most practical purposes. Uh, there's actually no practical reason anybody should ever know, have to know more than about 40 digits because with 40 digits, you could determine the, uh, the uh, size of the observable universe to within the size of an atom. And nobody needs to do that. But, you know, it's a, it's a histor historically interesting number for lots of reasons, not just um, for its definition. Here's the definition of pi, by the way. Uh, pi, as I'm sure most of you know, is equal. It's defined as the ratio of the circumference to the diameter of any circle. And it's sort of a remarkable fact in and of itself. It doesn't matter what circle you take. As long as it's in a plane, this ratio will be the same number, pi. Uh, approximately 3.14159. Um, and not only is it useful for the uh, circumference, but it's also, it also appears in the formula for the area. It turns out the area is equal to pi r squared. r is the radius of any circle. This is how you can compute its area, also involves pi. And not only that, but um, you can go from circles to spheres. And here's formulas for the volume and the surface area of a sphere. Volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed. Area is 4 pi r squared. So it's very useful. It already appears in these four formulas. And you can keep going if you want. Uh, you don't have to stop at three dimensions. We, we live in three dimensions, but you can mathematically define as many dimensions as you want. And you can even mathematically define uh, spheres of higher dimensions. And this is what's done here. And, and I already showed you formulas for for n equals uh, 1, 2, and 3, uh, but you can keep going. So on top, we have the volume of these n spheres, as they're called, or balls, n balls, and those people call them balls. So uh, it turns out that the formula for the volume in n dimensions of any of these balls of radius r all involve formulas involving pi, but once you get to four dimensions, they involve powers of pi. Notice the formula on top. One half pi out of the pi squared out of the fourth, so it's kind of interesting. But you still have pi uh, for volume uh, dimensions four and five. It has pi squared in it. For the dimension six and seven, it has pi cubed. Keeps going. The powers keep growing by one every two dimensions. Kind of interesting. Uh, and um, okay, so and you, there's even a general formula for arbitrary number of dimensions. This is the volume of an n sphere a sphere an n-dimensional sphere it's kind of an ugly formula i'm not going to go through the whole formula but you can uh you can apply this formula and calculate the answer in any number of dimensions pretty neat i think um and uh we don't have to stop there either i mean uh here's another uh, the, um, okay um bear with me for a second this function is called the riemann zeta function this funny letter on the left is a Greek letter zeta. So zeta of s, s is just an arbitrary um, positive real number, um, greater than one, I guess. Uh, if s is any positive real number greater than one, then zeta s is defined this way. It's just the infinite sum of one over n to the s power. Uh, and this sum you can show for all s greater than one, this sum converges, which means that zeta s is well defined. And why did I show you this? Because, as it turns out, if you apply zeta to even numbers, you always get a formula that involves powers of pi. Zeta of 2. That's the sum of the reciprocals of the squares of all integers. Um, that actually converges, and the answer is pi squared over 6. You can do it for higher powers as well. Zeta of the 4th, sum of the reciprocals of 4th powers of integers, that's pi to the 4th over 9. You keep going. Each each even number is going to give you a larger power of pi. It's always equal to the same power of pi as the argument. Um, and these formulas get uglier and uglier, but they all involve powers of pi. And these, these formulas all approach 1, too. So this is actually a way you could actually 
estimate pi. It's not a very practical one, but um, this zeta of 16th is very close to one. Um, but anyway, uh, I'll get to formulas for pi later. Let me just show you a few more applications. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with a normal distribution. This is, a, this is used in statistics all the time. Probably the most useful distribution in statistics. It's also called the bell curve or the Gaussian distribution. And, uh, you know, I think most of you are familiar with this. you got standard deviations. The middle is what's called the mean. And then uh, um, you go one standard deviation. So each of these widths on this diagram is one standard deviation. You go one standard deviation for the mean, you get about 68% of your data. Two standard deviations, about 95%. Three standard deviations, about 99.7%. This is pretty well known. But what's the formula for this curve? You might be wondering that. Well, the formula, as it turns out, remarkable it is, is involves a pi. Look at the square root of 2 pi in the denominator. Where did that come from? Doesn't seem like this has anything to do with circles. But and not, and not only does it involve pi, it involves a square root of pi, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, so formulas for pi appear in a lot of weird places where you might not expect them. Gaussian distribution, that's just one example. And like I said, it's a very useful thing. Here's some examples of some normal distributions. You can determine you know, what percentage of your data lies within a certain number of standard deviations of the mean. Uh, a lot of distributions studying statistics are very close to normal distributions, and the formulas all involve pi. Uh, not only that, uh, here's the uh, Einstein's equation of general relativity. Um, probably one of the most famous equations in the history of science. It says how much <coughs> space-time curves due to gravity. <laughs> it's kind of the modern theory of, uh, of gravity. Um, and notice that the formula involves pi, 8 pi g over c to the fourth. Pretty remarkable. Um, so not only is it useful in math, it's also useful in physics. And uh, there's, there's other applications as well, but that's all I'm going to talk about in this video. Um, I just want to finish by talking about computations of pi. Uh, pi is probably the most well-known, uh, it's the most accurately computed uh, uh, um, irrational number. It is irrational. I didn't even mention this, but pi cannot be expressed as a ratio of two integers. Uh, this was proved by a guy named Lambert, English mathematician by named Lambert in 1761. It's not only irrational, it's also transcendental, which means it's not the root of any algebraic equation with uh, integer coefficients. Uh, uh, but anyway, this is kind of a, uh, a history of uh, how accurately pi has been determined over the centuries. And, and we started in around 2000 BC. Uh, I guess we at that time, people only knew pi to about one or two digits. But then the first kind of um, you know accurate Calculation of pi was done in 250 BC by by a guy named Archimedes, probably the most famous ancient Greek mathematician. He actually only calculated pi at about three decimal places. That was pretty remarkable for the time, and still pretty practical. He used what's called the method of exhaustion. Um, he he looked at polygon regular polygons with more and more sides, and I think he he came up with this estimate using polygons with uh, 48 and 96 sides, regular polygons. And that was gradually improved. Um, by 480, we were already up to about 10 digits. Um, then by 1400, we were up to 30 digits. There was a guy named von Soylan in 1400 AD who uh, used the method of exhaustion and calculated pi to 35 di digits. And then it gradually got bigger and bigger. Uh, you know, Newton came up with calculus around, around 1700. And uh, then but shortly after that, there was a guy named Maschin who came up with a very nifty uh, series formula, was able to compute pi to 100 digits. This was all done by hand, by the way. So even by hand, as, you know, until uh, the computer age didn't start until around 1950. But, you know, look at this. I mean, before 1950, around 1945, I think the biggest, the best estimate was around 800 decimal places. It was actually an Englishman named Shanks who computed by hand the first, well, I think it was 700 digits. It turns out he made a mistake. He only had 521 correct. But once computers uh, were invented, 
the number just skyrocketed. We, you know, because you could just plug in the formulas into the computers. We already had very fast uh, converging formulas. We just uh, could do them by hand in a reasonable amount of time. But as computers became faster and faster, we've been able to compute more and more digits of pi. Not only that, we have come up with better formulas. Here's, uh, these are, um, okay, Ramanujan came up with the first three of these formulas. Chudowski, I guess, in 1987, he derived the most, the fastest converging series for pi. This formula on the bottom looks like a very ugly formula, but every every term of the series, if you can believe this or not, actually adds about eight decimal places to pi. The first term itself gives you a very accurate estimate. I think around 10 digits precision, but if you want to do better, you just add more and more terms, and uh, you get better better. I think now, I should show you that graph again. Yeah, I forgot to tell you how many digits are currently known. About 10 to the 13th digits. That's that ten of the twelfth is a trillion. This is, this is this is like two thousand and five. This isn't even updated. I think if you went till today, I think it is now known to a hundred trillion digits. Nobody needs to know that many digits. You might kind of be wondering why people even bothered calculating to that many digits. Well, I think there's a few reasons for that. Uh, let me just go back to this slide. Uh, one is it's kind of like climbing Mount Everest. Just do it because it's there, right? Uh, I think there's actually some more practical reasons. I think the most practical reason for knowing pi to like over a trillion digits, it's a good way of testing software because there's only one possible value of pi. And if you want to test a computer to make sure its software is working properly, have it calculate a lot of digits of pi because we already know what it is. So if it gets the right answer, we know it's working. That's one reason. And there's also curiosity. I mean, a lot of people have been studying the statistical uh, distribution of the digits of pi. Pi is what's believed to be a normal number, meaning that uh, there's no, uh, all, the, all the digits seem to be perfectly random. Uh, it's past every test of randomness anybody can think of. Um, and uh, that's what's known as a normal number. So there doesn't seem to be any patterns in the digits of pi. Uh, not only that, but there doesn't seem to be any patterns in the continued fraction of pi. Uh, there doesn't seem to be anything really special about the digits of pi. But like I said, it's there, and it's probably the most important mathematical concept there is, just because of all the uses of it. Uh, there's no practical reason to know more than about 40 digits, but because it's there, we know it to about 100 trillion. So anyway, that's my... Uh, that's my um, um, video on pie for today. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.